What is up, guys? Welcome back to the Wildcast. Hope you're all doing well out there. In this video, we're going to be looking at some quotes that we have from Gillian Maxwell speaking from inside the prison uh, through secondhand uh, contact with uh, with a journalist from the Mail on Sunday. So it's secondhand information. The, the journalist did not talk to Gillian Maxwell directly. Gillian Maxwell talked to her friends and family. Then the friends and family talked to the, uh, the journalist from the Mail on Sunday, which I think is like a subsidiary or something of the Daily Mail. Uh, that's what it looks like because they publish a lot of these uh, Mail on Sunday uh, articles or teasers on Daily Mail. So it's some kind of British thing I don't understand, but, but it seems like they're related. Uh, my British viewers will know uh, more information on that. But anyways, um, I'm going to read you guys some interesting stuff that I ran into in this article. We're going to go through some interesting pieces that I encountered. And some uh, there's it ranges from outright lies to wild exaggerations to some legit complaints about the prison to um, just outright lies. OK, I think I said that in the beginning. But anyways, yeah, there are some outrageous lies in here that I want to call out. I wasn't initially going to make a video about this. I put out a tweet and I was like, okay, I think that's enough. But then I ran into a specific thing that she said towards the end where she claims that she's not really a socialite. And she was insulted by the fact that the media called her a socialite, despite the fact that she's been a sugar baby her whole life, taking money from uh, basically her dad and Jeffrey Epstein and people like this. But she claims to be a working class person. So that that part pissed me, pissed me off to the point where I'm actually making this video because I want to address that. Okay, so let's get started in the beginning here. So not the beginning, but this toward, this toward the middle. I cropped out the parts I want to cover here. Um, so this is what she says. I wash my own clothes. The dryer is so loud. It's nicknamed the space shuttle because it sounds like it might take off. <laughs> my mail, both legal and personal, have been tampered with. Now, first of all, regular people like myself, I wash my own clothes at home. Now, that might be old fashioned, but but I wash and dry them, especially during COVID. I'm not going to go to use um, laundry machines that 100 other people have used and I think it's dirty and disgusting. So I wash my own clothes. That's my own thing, right? But rich people like Gillian Maxwell probably don't even do their own laundry. When she was not in prison, she probably didn't even do her own laundry. She probably did have a housekeeper. Um, anyways, but most of her life when she lived in England, they definitely had housekeepers, multiple housekeepers. The help is what they call them. Uh, the read these rich people. So uh, so yeah, she she's having to experience some circumstances in life that regular people like ourselves, working class people uh, have run into like washing our own clothes she's having to experience that so um so good on her on that part now the mail stuff that there's a little bit of truth to that there have been some delays in her mail when it comes to like a couple of days, uh, her mail has not been received because of logistical problems. The uh, the lawyers for Gillian Maxwell have been uh, complaining about that. The prison is trying to make sure that she gets her mail on time, but they, th that is a valid complaint. So I want to be fair uh, to Gillian Maxwell. Uh, she goes on to say legal mail that was handed hand delivered to the jail took a week to get to me. That's an exaggeration. It didn't take the week. It didn't take a week. It took a couple extra days. Even though the prison uh, rules say it should be uh, delivered within two 24 hours. Um, like I said, there have been some delays, but not a week. Most alarming was uh, it had postage stamp, which wasn't there when it was hand delivered. The bottom of the envelope, ha envelope had been opened. So some mail might be opened. Uh, her legal material should not be tampered with. Um, I've talked about that before. Some of the guards in this prison are incompetent idiots. So that's valid. But when it comes, I don't know what she's talking about with the stamps. She says that there was a mysterious stamp and that some of her mail was opened. Well, the prison does have the right to check um, non-legal materials when they come into the prison because it might there might be contraband in there so sh they can legally open some mail now I'm, sh I'm not sure about the exact types of mail they're allowed to open and not allowed to open every prison has different rules this is a federal uh, facility so they probably have very strict rules on that so it might be true that some of her mail was open so I I'm, I'm going to leave the possibility open that that was uh, that, that this is possibly true okay it's not unbelievable next on one occasion, um, she says she was frisked in a way she con uh, considered overly intrusive. Now, she complained about being sexually harassed by the guards. I think this is what she was talking about. I was given a pat down so aggressive and violent, my underwear found itself in a place it doesn't belong. So she had a shift down there. So she's upset about it. Uh, being pat down is part of being in prison. Okay, it's not the Ritz. Some of this stuff you have to get used to, but she's not used to it. That's why she's complaining. And, uh, you know, in some some level, I do feel sorry for people who had to be in prison, but 
Uh, then again, she has to suffer for the consequences of her actions. So there you go. Um, at a human level, you know, I don't want to. Sometimes I find myself having sympathy for even the most, un, uh, you know, unworthy characters. That's just that's just me. I'm not a psychopath, so I, I still do feel sorry for these people, even though they deserve some of the things that they get. The first underwear they gave me were enormous granny pants. <laughs> You could have put uh, five of me in them. I'll spare you descriptions of the stains. So I, I don't know. That's just a random thing. She exaggerates on almost everything she says. Five times your sight. I, I doubt that. Maybe it was a little bit loose, but I think this might be an exaggeration. But who knows? OK, next, when I pick up the phone and this is one of the great one of the silliest exaggerations ever, she should be writing stories, storybooks, fantasy, because she's really good at exaggeration and, and irony. When I pick up the phone to make a make a perfectly legitimate call, the guards rush towards me with such speed it leaves them breathless. There's no way that's true. Zero percent chance. This is a vast exaggeration. <laughs> the judges, uh, the judges, the guards are probably they're definitely monitoring her. There's multiple cameras on her and there are guards, multiple guards watching her. The idea that they run so fast that they run out of breath. I don't believe that. OK, so I highlighted that because this is one of the wild exaggerations that I was talking about. They report on everything I do in real time. Yes, they do, because uh, I don't know if you know this, but the prison failed to keep uh, Jeffrey Epstein, keep proper tabs on him. So they're not trying to make the same mistake that they did with him. That's why they're keeping an eye on you now. Um, now, yeah, so I'm going to leave it at that. I can say a lot more, but I'm going to leave it there. Prison life has forced her to develop a dark sense of humor and a peculiar relationship with the captors uh, who she says often make her life a misery. Uh, she found it funny when one guard uh, exclaimed the following. The problem with you, Maxwell, is you're, you're just not a criminal. And that's supposed to be ironic, I guess, saying that she's she's trying to say that the guards don't even think that she's. Uh, she's uh, guilty by say, by making a joke about it, saying you don't have the criminal mind. Uh, basically, call, they're probably calling her like dumb or something. But she thinks that funny. I don't get it. I don't I don't know. I don't get the joke. So I guess it's come, some kind of dark British humor that I don't understand as an American. So I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> Maybe somebody else gets it. She gives cooking lessons to the guards, saying the following. I give a five day meal plan for ten dollars, but post pandemic, I had to increase it to fifteen dollars. <laughs> guards from out of town ask for tips, which include where to get uh, the best pizza, my favorite food carts. Uh, they ask me what I'm reading and I share my favorite books. They were impressed when I cut my hair with nail clippers and it was somewhat straight. I only had a three inch by five inch mirror. They rewarded me with paper scissors and I suggested I might want to open a salon. So apparently these are all supposed to be jokes, although I'm not getting how this is funny. Um, I guess she's trying to say that she's clever and she's trying to make friends with the guards who are actually making her life miserable. I don't understand. I don't understand. Um, she goes on to say, I play peekaboo hiding behind pillars and the guards join in. There are always smiles all around. So are you miserable or are you having fun? I don't get it. Are you having fun with the guards? These are the same guards who are sexually harassing you. So, see, this is this is why it gets confusing when it comes to Gillian Maxwell. I think she's losing her mind uh, in there. And I'm saying that with all seriousness. She goes on to talk about how she has imaginary friends. OK, so we haven't gotten to that yet, but that's inter interesting as well. It's coming up. Then I have a monster move where I raise my hands and growl and they do it back. We laugh. So she seems to be having all kinds of fun. You might not want to make it seem like you're having fun behind bars when you're at the same time filing legal papers that talk about how you're being put in like, you know, Hannibal Lecter conditions and treating like pe treated like people in Guantanamo. It seems like you're having fun. So this is weird. This she volunteered this information uh, to other people. Mysterious events have led her to create an imaginary cellmate. Here we go. Despite the fact that she has been in solitary confinement from the start with a light being shunned into her cell every 15 minutes to ensure uh, she has not self-harmed. Strange things happen. The toilets flush. The shower turns on when no one is nearby. When it happens, it alarms the guard. So I created a cellmate, an imaginary friend called A17, who when something strange happens, I blame it on A17. So this is like this is why I said she's losing her mind, because even if you created an imaginary cellmate, why would the guards buy your story? <laughs> they know there's no A17. So I don't know what she's trying to do here. Maybe she's trying to sound like she's losing her mind or something. I don't know, but it's strange. OK, and super weird. 
Her most serious complaint, though, revolves around not being given adequate time to prepare for the six-week trial. She is facing more than 80 years in jail if convicted on all charges. Maxwell alleges she was given computers that don't work, that vital paperwork arrived late, and um, that for a while she did not have a proper desk to work at. The prison is so incompetent that they give her uh, grounds for these kind of arguments because there were some problems with computers. Although she was given a computer since the first time that she was put in prison, she did have a desk in her cell. Uh, there was pictures of that because they did like painted pictures of her cell. And uh, she did have access to computers. She had uh, multiple hours a day to talk on cell phones with her lawyers. So some of this stuff is bullshit, but they, they did have some problems with the computers when it comes to accessing some of the legal stuff. Uh, some of the screens weren't clear there's some there were some problems some legit problems so some of this is true although as usual you can't trust everything she says because she over exaggerates things and that's how she loses credibility credibility with people like me who are fair i'm ready to be fair i'm ready to go after anybody okay if the government does something wrong i call it i call them out and i've called them out multiple times in multiple videos i call out everybody so i'm very fair when i do my legal analysis but it makes it difficult when i know for a fact that she exaggerates and says things that are just not true like saying that the uh, the guards had to run towards her phone calls uh, being breathless. Just you don't need to do this over the top stuff, but she continues to do it. That's her personality. She can't help it. And her lawyer seems to be the same way. Uh, Bobby Sternheim. She also exaggerates things beyond reality. She says there is no presumption of innocence in the detention center. That's true, okay, because you're behind bars, so technically, yes, but when it comes to the courts, you are presumed to be innocent, but you, but but the court has decided that you're a flight risk, that you're going to fly to Britain or France and we're never going to see you again, that's why you're in prison, okay, until the trial starts. Pre-trial detainees like me, who by law are innocent until proven guilty, are treated like they are already convicted felons. There's some truth to that because you are you are technically behind bars and you're treated like a prisoner. Uh, she said it's wrong. It's un-American and unconstitutional. Well, like I said, there's a reason you're behind bars, right? There, so most people are given a given bail unless you're accused of a capital crime or unless the court has reasonable reason to believe that you will flee. And there is a legitimate concern that you might actually flee and not show up for your trial. That's why you're behind bars. So according to the law, it is American and it is constitutional to keep you in uh, in prison because you're a flight risk. Where are all the people who swore to uphold the Constitution? Here I am. I'm explaining the Constitution to you right now, okay? And nothing has been violated when it comes to your presumption of innocence. I made a video, my last video, talking about how you are presumed innocent until you're proven guilty. And if you missed that video, I'll link in the top right-hand corner. You can go check it out. I, I was very fair to Maxwell, as I am to all prisoners. I am very serious about the Constitution and affording everybody who's accused of a crime a fair trial. OK, and nobody else can argue otherwise by watching my videos. So there you go. Next, her greatest fear is not being able to find an impartial jury. Coverage of the case in the U.S. remains relentless, uh, with her being referred to as Jeffrey Epstein's madam and Epstein's socialite partner in crime. That's actually true. OK, people have been doing a lot of coverage over uh through the last year, but that doesn't mean that everybody is going to be biased against you. Even me, who I've who I've been, I've been doing close coverage of this case for the last two years, but even me, I can sit in the jury and be fair. If the government does not present uh, adequate evidence showing her guilt, then I'm not going to say that she's guilty, right? Even though, according to what I have seen, I personally think that she is guilty. If I was on the jury, I would be fair. So this idea that people have that that the regular Joe can't be fair because they've heard stories about you, that's a bunch of nonsense. As I explained in my last video, the judge goes over and beyond to explain to the jury before the trial starts exactly how to evaluate evidence to leave aside anything that you know from uh, outside the courtroom and to only focus on what the government presents okay everybody involved in the legal system uh, including the judge goes through painstaking efforts to make sure that people like Gillian Maxwell get a fair trial okay so regardless of whatever people are seeing in the media the judge will instruct the jury to only base their opinions, um, their legal opinion of guilt or innocence based on the evidence that's presented to them during the trial by the prosecution. OK, so most people can be unbiased, even if they've heard bad things about a person being tagged as a socialite feels derogatory and sexist designed to paint me in a negative light. 
I worked my entire life, starting with part-time jobs when I was 15. No man who had a similar professional career would be called a socialite. Oh, please. I'm overwhelmed by my feelings of sadness and shock at the grotesque and untrue narratives that are total fabrications and bear no re resemblance to reality. So this is the part that pissed me off the most. Pretending like she's not a socialite, pretending like she's some kind of working class person. You literally got everything handed to you by your dad since you were a kid, including a goddamn boat, right, later on in your life. And there were parties and hobnobbing with rich people since you were a kid. So in, in one direction, you can say, hey, this is the kind of life that she was used to. And that's why she went on to party even when she was an adult. And I can accept that. Since she was a kid, she's been exposed to this, you know, party culture of hobnobbing with uh, rich people. So in one way, you can say that this is what she's used to. And, I, and that's a fair argument, right? To her, this was normal behavior, right? Even though it's not normal behavior for regular people. Throughout her childhood throughout her teen years and her 20s and 30s this is the this is what she spent her life in okay until her dad died then the party ended and she had to come to America and she found Jeffrey Epstein. The reason she's in trouble now is because she stuck with Jeffrey Epstein because of his money and the comfortable life that he was able to provide her. And uh, she did some work here and there, contracting work and building, you know, helping build uh, some of his, his houses. Yeah, sure. You did some work there, but you were routinely going to parties and socializing with rich people. And that's why you have such an extensive Rolodex when it comes to all the rich people, you know, you and Jeffrey Epstein to deny the fact that she's a social socialite is ridiculous to say that the media is sexist and derogatory you are a socialite all there is is pictures of you hobnobbing with rich people and drinking wine and going to expensive parties that those are all facts in record okay that's not sexist and derogatory that's not untrue. Those are all accurate facts that the media has record, reported. Now, there are some people out there who are saying crazy things like Gil and Maxwell works for Mossad. That's insane. Gil and Maxwell is an idiot. Mossad would never hire her. OK, so the idea that she works for some intelligence agencies is ridiculous. So fair enough. Those are unfair attacks. But those are tiny little uh, corners of the Internet where crazy conspiracy theorists live. OK, most reasonable people like myself stick to the facts that can be proven on record. OK, and you are a socialite. You have been somebody who was a sugar baby first to your dad and then to Jeffrey Epstein. The reason you're in trouble, trouble right now is because you didn't leave Jeffrey Epstein uh, to begin with fast enough and you were with him for way too long. That's why you're charged with all these crimes. Okay, that's why you were flying with uh, Virginia Roberts on, on Jeffrey Epstein's planes. So give it a rest about how you're a working class person who worked all her life. Oh, please. You've been benefiting off the largesse of your dad and Jeffrey Epstein for most of your life. So this is the, that's the part that actually pissed me off enough to make this video. Otherwise, I would not have made this video. Her claiming to be a, a working man or a working woman is ridiculous. <laughs> OK, let's end this off. I'm terrified the overwhelming negative coverage will poison my jury pool and affect the outcome of my trial. Despite the evidence, which I feel confident it will prove my innocence. I look forward to having my day in court uh, and to prove I played no part in Epstein's crimes. I am innocent. So are you admitting finally that Epstein committed crimes? Because during the 2016 depositions, you said that you never saw anything untoward happen with Jeffrey Epstein when you were at his house. That's what she said. OK, we covered that on this channel. I went through both of her depositions from April and July, and she said multiple times that all these girls are lying, that Virginia Roberts is making all this stuff up and that Jeffrey Epstein never did anything wrong. Alan Dershowitz and Gillian Maxwell have yet to admit that Jeffrey Epstein did any crimes. It's which is a fact on record. OK, Rickeri proved that back in back in back with all of his interviews with those girls back in Miami. You were 17 then. Mm -hmm. What is it that you were told you would have to do? Give him a massage. Okay. During the massage, did he ask you to remove your pants or? Yes. That, that's a fact on record that he did all the things that 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 Rickeri and other people in the Miami Police Department accused him of. OK, those are not made up. What, what else happened when you were providing the massage? He took the towel off and he started pleasing himself, which I was very uncomfortable with. Like, I wanted to leave right when I got there. OK. As far as I know, until 2016, she was denying the fact that Jeffrey Epstein did anything wrong. So are you finally admitting that Jeffrey Epstein did commit crimes? Because if you are, great. She's finally admitting to something. And as I said before, she is afforded the presumption of innocence. I afford her that. The judge affords her that. And the legal system of the United States affords her that. 
So she's going to have a fair trial and all the facts that are relevant are going to be presented both both by the prosecution and by the defense. And uh, if she is found to be guilty, it's most likely because she is or her defense failed to make their case. And the reason that the defense fails to make their case is because she's guilty. OK, now that's my opinion. Like I said, she's going to have a fair trial and the, and the jury of 12 random New Yorkers will decide her fate. All right. So that's all I got to say for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, make sure to like the video, subscribe, hit the bell and press all for my future videos. If you like my content and you enjoy it, you've been watching for a long time. Please consider supporting me on Patreon. There'll be a link uh, down in the description box and in the end of the video. And you can support the channel for one dollar a month. OK, and I think that's a very simple ask for people who watch my content regularly um, because I do put a lot of work into these videos and a lot of time editing. OK, so if you like my content, please support me on Patreon. With that being said, I'll see you guys next time. As always, peace. Mega City One. 800 million people living in the ruin of the old world and the mega structures of the new one. Only one thing fighting for order in the chaos. Judges.